The biggest ship in the world has big responsibilities. Emma Maersk has only two weeks to sail across the globe with a half a billion dollar cargo. She will sail through dangerous seas. We know what we are doing, but we are also aware of the risk doing that. While her crew will work overtime to maintain this high-tech marvel. I, I prefer actually to do the dangerous part myself. Whatever it takes, Emma has got to arrive on time, and the clock is ticking. It's one of the busiest ports on the planet, Tanjung Palapas in Malaysia. It's the loading point for millions of containers a year from Asia, bound for Europe and North America. They carry everything from TVs to T-shirts, frozen fish to footwear, cameras to cosmetics. Today is a very heavy operation. We have uh, seven vessels uh, on berth. Uh, and uh, approximately, we are doing about uh, 10,000 containers. But the port's number one job is to load the world's biggest ship, Emma Maersk. 397 meters long, 20 stories tall. Emma dwarfs everything around her. She can carry a whopping 12,000 containers. A freight train with a load this big would have to be 70 kilometers long. All on one mighty state-of-the-art ship. Her unique silhouette is all boat. A sleek hull. A soaring superstructure amidships. She's clearly built for one purpose. To move enormous amounts of cargo as quickly as possible. Without those big boxes, Emma is an empty warehouse with a for lease sign in the window. In just three hours, she has to be loaded and gone. Today we have about uh, 2,000 uh, loading and 450 discharge. And the challenge will be that we need to sail out this vessel uh, as soon as possible. She's got just 13 days to reach Spain, 13,000 kilometers away. In the boxes is half a billion dollars worth of cargo, and delivering it late is not an option. Like giant spiders, six gantry cranes tirelessly load containers onto Emma. Each one weighs over five tons. And the best crane operators can load 30 an hour, looking down from their perch 60 meters above the ground. Each crane has a manager who confirms that the right containers are being loaded onto the right ship. It's vital that every container is placed properly. On board Emma, that's the job of ship's officers Ramos Galeatos and Niels Larsen. In the front, we have the most dangerous cargo. That would be acids, uh, flammable. If we have fireworks, class 1.4G, all the way to the aft, so that if we have a potential uh, risk on the vessel, it will be as far away from the living quarters, accommodation, and above all, the main engines. Dangerous cargo at the bow. High maintenance refrigerated cargo closer to the superstructure. Weather prone containers packed with expensive electronics below deck. A shift could mean catastrophe. So every box must be placed and then properly secured to guarantee stability. Especially if they run into a typhoon. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Eight stories up on the world's widest bridge, First Officer Galeatos weighs all the factors that could delay Emma. Right now, it's monsoon season, so he and the captain have to plan the voyage carefully. Hello, Ramos. Hello, Captain. So, are we ready for departure? Yeah, just finished. After 16 years of planning voyages, Danish Captain so Jorgen Sonicsen is an expert. In fact, he was born for this job. We have a history back in Denmark for seamen and seafarers, all the way back to actually the Viking first, but then, then later on to the big sailing ships. So you have checked all the charts and publication yep. is in place? Yep. Okay. After leaving Malaysia, 
Emma's next destination is the Suez Canal, a nine-day, non-stop voyage of 9,260 kilometers, and she can't be late. Uh, we will uh, depart the pilot station around uh, 1,700, and uh, then the required speed in order to arrive at Suez will be 22.7 knots. 22.7. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Based on weather and currents, they determine the most fuel-efficient route. They also consider human risks, like 21st century pirates. And again, we have made the track, uh, track uh, north of uh, Sokoto, yes, right in water. Sokoto. To stay as far as possible from the Somalian coast. I want to know. Ships uh, try to steer uh, clear of pirate activity, uh, but there's no escape from the Strait of Malacca, their only route to the Indian Ocean and the most active area of piracy in the world. What have uh, the chief officer told you about the departure time? How far are we? 1500. 1500 still? More or less, yeah. Okay, yeah, and what well. time is the pilot order? Uh, same for 1500. Finally, loading is complete, and together the gantry cranes pull away from the ship. Fifteen stories above the dock, Captain Sonicson has a bird's eye view of their departure. Of the With him is a local pilot, who by law must help guide Emma safely out of port. Thank you, and tell me when the thrusters are clear. All right, pilot, we are going out. And Emma will need all the help she can get. Departing Tanjung Pala Pass in Malaysia is always tricky, and Emma's size means she faces extra hazards in the harbor. She has to be pulled away from the dock and turned 180 degrees before she can start her engine. Two tugboats assist the ship's four starboard hull thrusters that push Emma sideways with powerful jets of water. The harbor's shallow, muddy bottom is dredged constantly, but Emma's size, weight, and draft are a deadly combination. Contact with the soft bottom could rip a hole in her hull. Her journey would be over before it's even begun. Captain Sonicson has to be very cautious. We know what we are doing, but we are also aware of the risk doing that. I'm just making sure that we are keeping ourselves in the middle of the fairway due to our restricted uh, draft. Okay, second, tell me when the propeller are clear. Emma completes her turn, and the world's biggest propeller, 10 meters in diameter and weighing almost 130 tons, can now go to work. If all goes according to plan, it won't stop turning for nine more days. But the sea has plans of its own. As Emma leaves port, a monsoon rolls in, turning the visibility to almost zero. I can't see. Not yet. Portent. Portent. Midship. Midship. Steady she goes, please. The mist hides dozens of ships. A collision could spell disaster, but Emma's navigation system identifies the position of each vessel. It's a beacon every ship has with uh, with a name and a call sign and data of the ETA and where they're going. 30 minutes later, as the monsoon blows by, Emma finally clears the port. The pilot disembarks, and she can now accelerate to her cruising speed of 40 kilometers an hour. With pirate-infested waters dead ahead, Chief Officer Niels Larsen has to do all he can to secure his ship. We're going through a pirate area tonight. Modern-day uh, pirates don't steal do cargo. The they capture tonight. crew for ransom. I'm sure that we need to rig for, for pirate uh, precautions. In the past month, there have been four attacks on smaller ships. Emma's best defense is her size but the crew still lash high-pressure water hoses to her railings. They're not cannons, but they can shoot a blast of water hard enough to stop a pirate in his tracks. As Emma enters the Strait of Malacca, she's locked up tight, the hoses turned on, and the crew waits out the night.
The night has come and gone. It's been 24 hours since Emma Maersk left Malaysia. The pirates in the Strait of Malacca stayed away from the massive ship. Now, she changes course and heads west into the vast Indian Ocean. Just five degrees north of the equator, the weather is hot, humid, and unpredictable. Captain Sonicson is all too aware that Mother Nature is his biggest challenge. Okay, what uh, are you calling very rough? Uh, there must be some swell up there. Uh, yes, sir. Emma is totally exposed to extreme conditions that could wreak havoc on her cargo. Right now, the scorching tropical sun is her biggest enemy. Emma's most delicate cargo, perishable food, is packed in refrigerated containers called reefers. If they lose power, their contents could spoil within hours. Millions of dollars and Emma's reputation would be lost. All containers must be monitored constantly. Every day, Niels Larsen inspects the boxes on board. It's a grueling task, as cadet Rasmus Hoganog knows. He's learning the ins and outs of Emma so he can become an officer. I'm a dual cadet, so that means I have to be both in the Indian and on deck. So on this big ship, there's many, many things to learn. They check that the container stacks are stable and secure, that the reefers full of exotic frozen foods aren't malfunctioning, that the dangerous cargo, like fireworks and hazardous chemicals, is sealed and safe. Problems with any of them, hundreds of kilometers from land, could put Emma out of business. But inspecting the ship isn't easy. Emma is enormous. The daily checkup is no stroll in the park, especially under the blazing equatorial sun. A simple walk all the way around the ship is a 1.2 kilometer hike. And a climb up the six story tall container stacks is like scaling a small mountain. So I don't climb down until I'm all the way down. I'll wait until you're clean. That's good. And watch the rope. Checking on the cargo below deck is a harrowing six story descent into the bowels of the ship. It's dark and it's not for the faint of heart. And again, when you're walking down here, watch uh, the gaps. You could actually fall in between. Yeah, that's what I'm Okay. If the containers are paramount, equally critical are the lines holding them in place. If the stacks are unstable, Emma could capsize. Alvin Serenilla and Sammy Abongan have 40 years at sea between them. They know Emma's size helps keep her stable, but they leave nothing to chance. It's good because I cannot feel any rollings and not so much pitching and rolling, so I don't feel seasick this year. Doing a checking all the lashings, make sure that they're all tight, so we have to check it every time, especially when we have a long voyage. While the able-bodied seamen sweat it out in the heat, the refrigeration units work overtime to keep their cargo cool. It's a crucial job, too. And electrician John Stephenson has to make sure that nothing goes wrong. He's got 176 reefers to babysit. Emma could carry a thousand. Each one is packed with expensive foods like caviar, chocolate, and New Zealand lamb. You can see the temperature is minus 20 degrees Celsius. Some of them can go down to minus 35, and we have some special reefers we call the super freezer. They go down to minus 65 degrees Celsius. Sensors monitor the temperatures of the containers. Today, one of them triggers an alarm in the unit, and it's relayed to a computer terminal in the control center. And here you see there is an alarm. I can go and highlight it. I can watch what is the alarm. If it's serious, some of Emma's valuable cold cargo could be in jeopardy. And I can see that it is a minor fault, so there is nothing to be worried about. The dangerous cargo containers don't have sensors, but they get a meticulous once-over. Because their contents are toxic, sometimes volatile, a tiny crack could lead to a big explosion or a poison gas leak. Day in, day out, Emma is inspected from bow to stern, top to bottom. Today, at least, above deck, 
everything is in order. But below deck, there's more to worry about than just containers. In the center of the ship, right below the superstructure, sits the world's largest diesel engine, the heart of Emma Maersk. It weighs 2,300 tons. Its 14 cylinders produce 110,000 horsepower, as much as 1,100 cars. Chief Engineer Michael Sort and his team have one big job. Keep the world's largest engine running to power the world's longest propeller shaft that turns the world's biggest propeller. We're right now in the shaft tunnel of the MMS. We are walking next to the shaft. As you can see, the shaft is rotating. It's rotating at 84 RPMs, the same speed as the propeller is in the water. From the coupling at the main engine all the way to the stern, the propeller shaft is 120 meters long. And at the end of the tunnel is Emma's massive propeller. For the next eight days and 9,000 kilometers, Emma's one and only propeller must turn constantly if she's going to reach the Suez Canal on schedule. Her engine crew has to make sure that it does. They'll use high-tech wizardry, over 8,000 sensors that monitor everything from fuel consumption and exhaust emissions to the performance of all 14 cylinders. They'll back that up the old-fashioned way with routine engine maintenance. But at sea, nothing is ever routine. A critical piece of the engine, one of its massive diesel generators, has just failed. Well, this generator is uh, very important. It's one out of five. And uh, they are used to uh, produce electricity and power to our refrigerated cargo. The reefers are in danger. The generator must be repaired. And the crew have only a few hours to fix it. The tropical heat is intense. There are millions of dollars of refrigerated cargo at stake, and Emma is in the middle of nowhere. Emma Marisk is engulfed in the searing heat of the Indian Ocean, carrying millions of dollars in frozen food, and she just lost one of her generators. In this room, we have two diesel generators uh, of 4,100 kilowatt. If we have had a problem with a cooler. The cooler, or condenser, keeps the generator from overheating. To fix it, they have to shut it down. Problem is, Emma's other generators can only pick up the slack for a few hours. Then, the stress will become too great. Emma may have to slow down. So the engineers have to move fast. So as you can see now here, we've got the cooler pretty much all the way out. We just need to lift it out. So of course, uh, we take precautions. We can't uh, have air on, all the cooling water is shut off. And uh, that's about it. We are all set to pull it out. Everything on board relies on the generators to operate. From the kitchen to the bridge, from the navigation and computer systems, to heating, lights, and especially refrigeration. Without power, the refrigerated containers will bake in the sun, and millions of dollars worth of food could spoil. Emma is just five degrees north of the equator, 500 kilometers off the south coast of Sri Lanka. And it's hot, 32 degrees on deck, and in the engine room, 40 degrees. The condenser weighs more than 400 kilograms. In the blasting heat, it feels like a ton. Six hours go by. Six hours of sweat and toil. But at the end of it, the generator is back online. The cold containers are safe, and the generators are still pumping power throughout the ship, especially the galley where dinner is just about to be served. For the appetizer, and then we'll have um, Jan Muller has been a chief steward for 25 years and knows what it takes to feed a hungry crew. The kitchen is one of the most uh, important uh, on the ship. If you have a lousy cook and lousy food, then um, 
The ship is not running proper. Today, Jan and his crew are preparing a special meal. It's Saturday, the symbolic end of the work week, even though there's no such thing as a day off at sea. Working on a ship is a real full-time job. Eight weeks on, eight weeks off. It's a part of the social welfare on board the ship to, uh, to make something uh, win like this. Pe people are looking forward to it, that's for sure. Creature comforts like good food and a soft bed aren't just perks. They're absolute necessities. Special meals and drinks like non-alcoholic beer help distract the crew from the stress and monotony of life at sea. After dinner, off-duty crew head upstairs into the superstructure to relax in one of the ship's recreation areas or in their quarters. Like everywhere, there's a hierarchy on the high seas. The captain and chief engineer get the penthouse suites. Then, it's the senior officers, junior officers, engineers, seamen, and cadets. In all, there's room for 30. There are also two TV rooms, an internet cafe, a full gymnasium, and of course, the laundry room. For a sailor, life on board Emma isn't bad, but they are at sea. And sometimes things go wrong. A fire alarm at sea is a chilling sound. Emma may be a tough ship to sink, but a fire could bring unthinkable disaster. But this time it's only a drill. The crew musters in the control center. We have a reported fire in... Nobody has ever fought a fire on a ship Emma's size. So training for one is extremely important. In this drill, the fire is located in a dangerous cargo container at the bow. Poisonous fumes could spread throughout the entire ship. Every fire is different when the cargo is dangerous. Until they know how to fight this one, an advanced team is organized to cool the container and control the fire. I need you to prepare a set of hoses from here and start cooling as soon as you can up here. And you have a radio? Yes, I have yeah. Very good. Up on the bridge, the first officer changes Emma's course, so the wind will direct smoke and fumes away from the ship. It's also your course to uh, port, so the wind will blow through the port side. Down below, the fire has been identified. It's a toxic chemical fire. To fight it, a smoke team throws on the gear that will protect them from the fire and the poisonous fumes. Uh, John, how are we doing with the hoses? While the advance team moves forward. Well, I have six guys dispatched for the bay number six to prepare three hoses all in all. Two for cooling and uh, one for the container firefighting equipment. With no time to lose, Niels rushes forward to observe the fire drill. John, where's the hose without pressure? When the smoke team gets to the fire, the advance team is already hosing the container down with seawater. The smoke team approaches cautiously. They don't know what to expect. They've been well trained to stay low, to keep below the smoke and toxic fumes. A steel plate stands in for the side of the burning container. They drill a hole in it with a high-speed drill and insert a high-pressure water hose called a spike. In seconds, it's over. The spike does its job, spraying the entire inside of the box. The fire is out, but they continue to cool things down just in case. The crew is hot, exhausted. But if there's ever a real fire, this training could save their lives. Uh, I want to compliment you guys. You did a really nice and serious effort. And uh, if we have that kind of effort during a live situation, I would be proud to work with you. <laughs> Today was just practice. Tomorrow, Chief Officer Larson will put on another oxygen mask and descend into a void full of poison gas. Only this time, it won't be a drill. 
Six days into her voyage from Asia to Europe, Emma Maersk is deep in the Indian Ocean. Sea conditions are perfect, which allows some of Emma's crew to embark on a dangerous operation deep in the bowels of the ship. The bilge tanks full of gases that could kill in seconds have to be inspected for cracks. Located at the bottom of the ship, bilge tanks are used to store liquid waste, rain, water, oil, diesel, detergents, and chemicals. There's no such thing as a clean bilge, and they need to be checked constantly for leaks. And because Emma is so new, her tanks are unique. They're poisonous. The new paint, the fresh paint, uh, gives carbon monoxide when it dries up. Uh, but um, in that time, we will have uh, a lot of fumes building, and they will tend to so fall down to the bottom. So. Uh, it's tough breathing and, uh, you know, you got the carbon monoxide and eventually you would pass out and you wouldn't know it really. So we take care of ourselves. That's it. Today, Niels and Michael will descend into a forbidding hole that leads to the bilge tank known as the void. They can't go down without oxygen tanks. They need them to survive in the dark, hot labyrinth of steel bulkheads and noxious gases. It's a hazardous assignment so only Niels will climb down all the way. Michael stays one level above and waits, just in case. Michael will be having the radio and I will bring one with me down the void. And he will have uh, contact with the bridge. I will let him know how many levels I go down so he know where to find me if something goes wrong. It's a suffocating 40 degrees down there. The heat and the heavy oxygen tanks make it impossible to stay down for long. When they emerge, their gas meter reads off the scale. The safe maximum is 20 parts per million of carbon monoxide. The meter reads 102. Without oxygen, two of Emma's most important officers would have been dead in 30 seconds. I, I prefer actually to do the dangerous part myself. I feel good that uh, I take the responsibility and uh, that my crew is safe. I agree with Nils. Uh, you have to do it yourself in order to delegate it to others. That's our job as officers. Safety first is a practice that extends beyond the well-being of Emma's crew. As she travels west, still far from land, Emma is also careful not to harm the fragile ocean ecosystem. In deep ocean, far removed from the public eye, ships are notorious for dumping their bilge tanks. It's shocking and illegal. But all ships are allowed to throw some garbage overboard as long as they're more than 40 kilometers from shore. But Emma doesn't throw anything over the side. She stores all her garbage safely on board. Dumping bilge or garbage is a huge environmental problem. But the carbon emissions that ships pump into the atmosphere is an even bigger worry. In fact, commercial shipping is responsible for releasing more carbon into the air than trucks and jets combined except for Emma. She is the biggest ship with the biggest diesel engine in the world, but she is more fuel efficient and emits less exhaust than a vessel half her size. When they built this big ship, they built her eco-friendly. She's got a state-of-the-art waste heat recovery system that no other ship in the world has. The system recycles the massive amount of gas the engine exhausts out mixes it with fresh air, and then sends it back into the engine to be used again. Recycling exhaust gases can save up to 10% of the engine's power. That's enough energy for 5,000 homes. In the engine control room, Michael and Cadet Anders Mortensen monitor the system. As you can see here, we are running with a 7.3% waste heat recovery. 
and uh, of course that reduces our fuel considerably. It results in you are able to throttle down. Okay, so it's only a better fuel economy. Yes, you are improving on the fuel economy. You could say that uh, we are operating the vessel very green here. Yes. Emma's carbon footprint is made even smaller by the silicone coating on her hull. It's new, it's revolutionary, and it makes her so streamlined that she saves another 1,200 tons of fuel every year. A jumbo jet carrying the same weight as Emma would travel only half a kilometer. Using the same amount of fuel, Emma could travel 66. And this big ship holds a lot more than a jet. She's carrying 12,000 containers. The last generation of container vessel was able to carry 7,000 containers. Their fuel consumption is a little bit lesser than ours, but not as much as we can carry almost twice the cargo. Efficient she may be, but that won't help Emma when she hits the Suez Canal in a few days. Then she'll be at the mercy of a narrow waterway, famous for its bottlenecks. If Emma is delayed in one, the crew will be hard pressed to get her to Spain on time. Emma Maersk has sailed across the vast Indian Ocean in just seven days. She's reached the Gulf of Aden and is within striking distance of the Suez Canal. Next, she'll make a hard right turn into the Red Sea through the Strait of Bab el Mandeb, Arabic for the Gate of Tears. It's only 20 kilometers wide, not much room in heavy traffic. Over three million barrels of oil pass through the strait every day. She makes it through, still on schedule. But when she turns north into the Red Sea, Emma sails into strong gale force winds whipped up on the deserts of Egypt and Saudi Arabia. It seems like the wind are picking up. Yeah. How do we do it? We do it fine. It requires speed as much. Okay. Okay. Emma has no problem fighting the wind, but technical problems can take her by surprise. A piston rod has snapped in half inside one of the engine's 14 massive cylinders. Our excellent motorman, he observed that a nut was loose on, the, on, the, on this particular bolt here. The piston rod drives the cylinder head up and down to produce power for the engine. If they don't fix it, there could be big problems. A damaged cylinder could force Emma to slow down. And right now, they're in heavy seas only 200 kilometers from the Suez. We could have continued, but it would have uh, most likely resulted in a damaged cylinder head. We decided why not replace it while we're sailing. But it's not easy. The engineers need to shut the cylinder down and reroute its fuel, and they'll have to adjust the power loads in the other 13. The piston rod they're replacing is a 6-meter, 400-kilogram monster and impossible to lift or manipulate by hand. But they fix it. In less than an hour, the new one's in. Number 14 is back up, and Emma never lost speed and didn't burn any extra fuel. No stops, nothing, and uh, everything was done safe, and uh, that's the way to do it. Once again, Emma has dodged a problem, and she hasn't lost any time. It's critical that Emma gets to the Suez on time. A hundred ships a day pass through the canal. But it's so narrow, they can only travel in one direction at a time. They go in convoys of up to 30 ships. If Emma misses her convoy, or if it's delayed, her half-billion-dollar cargo could be late. But right on time, at one in the morning, the big ship arrives at the southern end of the Suez. Her convoy through the canal is due to leave at first light. Tonight, she'll rest. For the first time in almost 5,000 nautical miles, the captain orders Emma to slow down. She's been going for nine days. We're going to slow ahead. Slow ahead. 
They look for a parking spot for the world's biggest ship. We are going to stay at anchor at number 27. That's this one. That's a good position. Very good position. Emma's been given an outside berth. Now, she just has to drop her 130-ton anchor, one 200-kilogram link at a time. Remus, please let go for anchor, five shackles on deck. Five shackles on deck, port anchor. Bridge Remus, we have uh, five shackles on deck, chain is up and down. Okay, then you put the brake on and uh, see whether the anchor is holding and then we can put the bars on. And Roger that. The anchor holds, and Emma is secure for the night. All they can do now is wait for tomorrow. With the rising of the hot desert sun, the importance of the Suez Canal can finally be seen. Dozens of ships of every shape, size, and nationality are waiting to convoy north. 140 years ago, the only way to Europe was around Africa a 12,000-kilometer-long journey that took three months. Now, it takes just 12 hours through the 163-kilometer-long Suez Canal. When it opened for business in 1869, it was the most strategic waterway in the world. It still is. But today, there's a problem. A vicious storm has backed up traffic southbound and the northbound convoy can't get through. One hour passes, then another, and another. All the crew can do is monitor the radio and watch the harbor. It's like waiting for a pot to boil. Finally, a southbound convoy appears. The canal is clear at last, ready for Emma's northbound convoy. The sight of pilots being dropped off at each ship is the signal she's been waiting for. Time to weigh anchor. Almost five hours late. But at a controlled speed of just nine kilometers an hour, the Suez still can't be rushed. century canal builders never imagined a ship as big as Emma. Her 56-meter beam is a tight squeeze. The convoy of ships stretches almost five kilometers. Emma, the largest and longest, takes up the rear position. Four hours in, the convoy passes through man-made Great Bitter Lake. The lake is an important part of the canal's design, an anchorage for convoys waiting for another to pass. By sunset, Emma is still only three quarters of the way through the canal. The desert evening is beautiful. But to Captain Sonicson, it's just another reminder that he's now behind schedule. There are clients in Spain relying on him, livelihoods that depend on the goods he's delivering. He has to find a way to get there on time. Emma Maersk has finally reached the open waters of the Mediterranean Sea. But her passage through the Suez Canal was fraught with delays. Now there's a hiccup in her schedule. The holdup in Suez put Emma behind for the first time on her journey. Algeciras, Spain is still about 3,500 kilometers to the west. The big ship will have to burn more fuel in order to speed up and get there on time. Captain Sonicson has to figure out just how much faster Emma needs to go. He analyzes everything from ocean currents to headwinds to calculate a new speed. 
Good morning. This is Captain. Please adjust to 95 RPM. 95 RPM. That's an increase of 11 RPM. She'll burn more fuel, but Emma is back on track. Three days later, a landmark, the Great Rock of Gibraltar, gateway to the Western Mediterranean. We are just on track and on schedule, yes. I will reduce to 60 RPM. Algeciras is one of the busiest ports in Europe and one of the toughest to navigate. Its fierce currents and swirling winds are a treacherous soup. They're cooked up where the sea funnels through the tight Strait of Gibraltar. Where the Mediterranean meets the Atlantic, it's only 13 kilometers wide. A half-sunken bulk carrier is a grim reminder of how perilous these waters can be. I'll uh, make it a half ahead now. Half ahead. There's a really strong current around these waters that uh, you have to be careful when you approach the Gibraltar. Will it use to slow ahead? Slow ahead. Okay, helmsman, please take over the wheel now for heading 325. 325. Thank you. Traffic picks up. A bulk carrier is trying to leave the harbor, and she's about to become a real problem for Emma. Yeah, Motor Vessel Cadmus, this is Emma Mersk on your port bow. We would like to pass ahead of you. I see you are speeding up. So I'm still off my monitoring my course to starboard now. Starboard? Emma is too big. She can't change course quickly enough. The other ship has to give way or risk a collision. We won't have time to pass. We don't have space to pass astern of you, so the only possibility is to pass ahead of you. Make it half ahead. Only moments to spare, and the bulk carrier changes course. Okay, midship. Thank you very much for the Vessel Cadmus. We'll pass Steady on 318. It could have been ugly. Instead, good manners and good seamanship resolved a tight fit. But the clock is ticking. It just took Emma more than an hour to travel one kilometer. As Emma maneuvers slowly, a pilot comes on board. He'll help guide the ship into her berth while the tugboats make sure Emma meets her docking schedule. The speed is 2.8. Okay, did, did the slow ahead? Did the slow ahead. Emma makes her final turn. The captain and pilot move to the starboard bridge wing to oversee her final approach. Emma uses all her port thrusters, and she's pushed hard by tugs fore and aft. Meter by meter, she edges closer to the dock. Negative, we still have to move a few meters ahead. About 15 meters ahead. 15. Okay, we are alongside and we are in position. Finally, Emma's spring lines are ready to be discharged. Okay, stop engine, okay. All right, gentlemen, we are in position and uh, we are alongside. So as soon as you have the swing lines, please tighten them up. Nice job, pilot. OK, thank you. Emma touches the dock dead on schedule. It's been 14 days and 13,000 kilometers since she left Malaysia. The giant gantry cranes waste no time. They've got to unload 2,000 of Emma's 12,000 containers. She's due to leave port in 14 hours. The ship's crew takes a short break while the crane crews do their job. Then it's back to work. Chief Officer Larson wants to squeeze in a lifeboat drill. Chief Engineer Sort has another cylinder to repair. And Chief Steward Muller is cooking up another special dinner before Emma leaves tonight. And as you can see, very juicy. But all Captain Sonicson can do is wait. Neither he nor his great ship, Emma Maersk, belong in port. They have a schedule to keep. Without a schedule, we, we would not have a vessel. And uh, without customers, we would not have a vessel. This year alone, 
they will travel 315,000 kilometers. That's like circling the globe seven and a half times. For Emma, the journey has no beginning and no end. She was built with a single purpose, to deliver the world's commerce on time, on budget, and never stop.